Hi folks, Tris here. Thanks for listening to Modern Prometheus, and thanks especially to all of you who have joined our Patreon. We don't run ads, so the whole podcast is supported by you. If you'd like to help out, head over to patreon.com forward slash Prometheus. Members get behind-the-scenes notes, early access, bonus episodes, and a lot more exciting stuff. This story is called Vesper Flight, and is for everyone who has ever wanted to just fly away. It was the evening after the hottest of summer days, when the air still shivered over the tarmac like a vulture and the wind smelled of hot grass. Buildings stood with windows agape, the swifts shrieked through the slowly cooling sky, and on the corner of Drewstead and De Montford Road, the god of lost things was closing his shop for good. He hadn't intended it to be his last day when he opened up this morning. There was no sense of finality. It was just a day like thousands before. Maybe that had been what had caused something, inside a brain which was far more brittle than he realised, to snap. During the day, he had sold the locations of three wedding rings, one beloved teddy bear, two cats, both thankfully still alive, an online banking password, one set of car keys and a pair of glasses. Off the shelves of his shop, on which appeared with sometimes depressing frequency the items no one was looking for and no one wanted back, he had sold a scarf, a range of paperbacks, and a small china elephant. He didn't have to find those items. They found him. Because he was the god of lost things. This shop had been his for over a decade, and there were still three years on the lease. And at the end of it all, the god flips the sign to closed, bolts the lock with a mechanical chunk, rolls down the metal shutters that still had R.I.P. Trevor Knowles graffitied over them, and decides he is never coming back. Like, never! Bren eyes him quizzically over her triple-shot caramel latte. This is enough of a shock to make her ignore the buzzing of her phone. Never, never. Never, never he says. So much never, Peter Pan is moving in. Why? The god does not say because he felt like he was tied to the place by a chain wrapped round his throat. He does not say because he feels like his feet are stuck to the floor. He does not say that every time someone asks him for something, the chain feels tighter and the floor feels stickier. He does not say these things because he does not really understand them himself. So instead he says... I just wanted to change, I guess. You guess? The god shrugs. He knows what he said. Yeah, I'm done with it. Done with being the god of lost things. Are you sure? Bren nods at a small badge on the table in front of them. It's a band pin, showing a marigold with a heart in the centre. It had been on the god's seat when he went to sit down. That's nothing. Bet you a fiver. No. So, what- oh- Damn, one sec. Bren's phone has started to ring. She holds up a couple of fingers. Two minutes, BRB. And then dashes outside the cafe, where the god can hear her talking in angry tones. He wouldn't want to be on the other end of one of those conversations. Bren's work voice is the kind of voice you might expect from someone named after automatic weaponry. He turns the marigold pin over idly in his hands. Unbidden, it begins to tell its story. The purchase from a gig merch table, which was just a plank of wood on top of two barrels. The unhooking from a coat. He puts it down, quickly. He doesn't want to know. Bren is still outside. Now, there are gestures. He sees her maybe once a week these days. Often less. And even on these lunch dates, it's becoming more and more obvious he's not all she's paying attention to. The Boundswood planning department takes up a lot of her time. He'd met Bren when a group of his friends went out with a group of her friends. She'd had green pigtails, bright blue lipstick and a nose ring, and at one point of the night she'd turned to him while holding four shots of tequila and a feather boa and said, I've had a terrible idea. He doesn't see those friends anymore. He doesn't think Bren saw hers. But they saw each other, now and then. More then than now these days. Sorry! Bren hurries back inside. No green pigtails anymore. No nose ring. Still fancy lipstick. A different colour each time. No, wait. Not that either today. Look, I've got to dash off. Something's come up that can't wait. Hey, so 
what are you doing with yourself these days? Uh, bit of this, bit of that. I've got some money saved up. People pay quite a lot to get their wedding rings back. So, just savings. Savings, selling a bit of stuff on eBay, looking for other jobs, and not finding things. We've got an opening, if you fancy that. Just think, you too could be part of the sex and glamour that is the Boundswood Council Planning Office. I don't know, it seems completely different from everything you've ever done. Absolutely is. That's what you wanted, right? Fair. The waitress comes over to collect their mugs. As she does so, she looks at the badge on the table. Oh my god, I lost that two days ago. Thanks so much! The god of lost things makes a point of not looking at Bren. Well, you might be done with being the god of lost things, she says. But I don't think being the god of lost things is done with you. The god has a flat on the second floor of a Victorian house conversion, the kind with a balcony the size of a postage stamp and different coloured bricks patterning the walls. We don't do that anymore, he thinks. We just build boxes. Part of him says, insulated boxes. The city still bakes in high summer, and the heat closes around him like a glove. Bren gave him a business card with the number of her manager, Joan. It sat in his jacket pocket. There are swifts nesting in the eaves. He likes swifts, because they are never lost. He read a book about it once, called Vesper Flights, one of the ones that had turned up on his shop shelves. In the morning and evening twilight, the time of Vespers, Swifts will fly so high that if you flew with them, you would see the stars. And here, every day, they read the wind, ride the magnetic currents. They discover their place in the world. A swift always knows where it is. A swift always knows where everything is. Sometimes, he'll sit out on his postage stamp balcony and watch them dive and whirl in their strange orbits a screaming, scything orrery. It is while watching them climb higher and higher that the god thinks how nice it must be to always know where you are. He starts. It's quite a thing to be someone like the god and realise that you yourself are the thing that is lost. I met him once. This little god. He was happier then. The weight of divine expectation was not yet holding him down, and there were no swifts in the air to remind him he couldn't fly. I was on a bridge, listening to the river wash beneath me, watching a pair of women drop things into it from a bulwark. He was there too, standing out the way of the traffic, scrolling through news sites on his phone. He said, If you don't mind my saying so, you look like you've lost something. I smiled and said, Your negging game is not strong. He blushed, took a couple of steps backward, hands raised. Yeah, I thought. You better run. Sorry, he said. Not what I meant, just professional curiosity. He paused, then said, But have you? So many things. I sighed. Do you want them back? Not even one. Two weeks after he closed his shop, the god of lost things finds himself back. Not to reopen, just to make sure the place is still there. It is. He had thought that closing down would give him a sense of peace, but instead he finds himself permanently restless. He wonders if maybe Brem was right. Maybe this is the place he will find himself. He regrets it as soon as he sees the man pacing about in front of the shuttered windows. He tries to turn around, but he is spotted. Hey, hey! The god of lost things forces a smile. Yes? This is your place, right? Used to be. What gives? You on holiday or something? No, I just don't do this anymore. Okay, look. The man fishes out his wallet, pulls a set of notes and waves them in the god's direction. What'll it be? Five hundred? A thousand? The god sighs. Maybe one more time won't hurt. 
What did you lose? Oh, thank Christ. Look, I was in the Oasis. The god's heart sinks like Atlantis. The Oasis is a casino, and he knows where this is going. The table was rigged, man. I lost 20 grand. You've got to get it back for me. Sorry, the god says. I can't help. But you just said, I find lost things. You didn't lose anything. You know exactly where it went. No. No, that's not fair. My wife doesn't know. I have to get it back. I'm sorry. I'd help you if I could, but this isn't my area. The god turns away, but the man grabs him by the shoulder. The sky darkens and there is a crack of thunder. The god of lost things may be a small god, but he is still a god. The man drops him and backs away. The god stalks off, now in a far fouler mood. Bren, he decides, was not right. He gets an email from Bren, cancelling their next coffee date, saying she's got too much work to do. She's arranged an interview for him next week. The email, despite being from her personal address, is signed, Best Regards. The God of Lost Things tries to read. The words turn to slurry on the page and refuse to enter his brain. The God of Lost Things shoots wave after wave of enemies that enter from all corners of the screen, but he cannot focus on his little ship and constantly crashes because he flies in the wrong direction. The God of Lost Things tries to do nothing at all. He lies on the sofa, the discarded book tented over his face like a tiny marquee. He says, Alexa, radio on. Sometimes, after a busy day, he would come home and listen to the station, Modem Prometheus. It would read a litany of locations and qualifiers. Countenham, unstable, low to none, medium. He did not understand it, but it was noise, it was company. Now when he tries to tune in, the station is gone, and there is nothing but static. Oh, he thinks, though I've lost you, too. Maybe he should try and get another job. The interview room contains more shades of grey than the God of Lost Things realised existed. The walls are a tastefully light found fossil. The carpet is warm graphite. The desk is a laminate urban chic, while the metal struts are a slightly darker wishing well. A plant sits in one corner, and while it is definitely green, it looks like it's trying very hard to be Dove Slate. The interviewer is looking at him, pointedly. He can feel it. There's a tug, like he just tried to put a slug off his eyeball. I'm sorry, he says. Can you repeat that? The woman sat at the desk, whose face the god cannot look at, says, I asked if you could tell me about a time you had to manage a large project. The god of lost things does not want this job. He knew that as soon as the interviewer, Joan, he recalls, the name is less slippery than the face, walked in. But Bren arranged this for him, and he doesn't want to make her look bad. So he talks about the move of his shop from the original site to the one on the corner of Drewstead and De Montfort. Talks about the inventory he took. Talks about the small advertising campaign he ran. Indeed, the only one he ever ran. To let customers know, so he didn't just become another thing they had lost. Joan makes a note on a standard-issue notepad with a standard-issue blue biro. She asks him something else, and the god doesn't hear that either. He can't concentrate on anything except the things Joan has lost. There is no empathy. There is no humanity. There is no soul. He wonders if she even knows they are gone. He tries to look at her, over and over. He can't do it. His eyes skid off her face like a stilt walker on a marble. I'm sorry, he says. Can you repeat that? The god of lost things stacks shelves in a supermarket. In his hands, products morph into brands long forgotten and remind people of childhood. But when they try to buy them, the barcodes are no longer recognised. The God of Lost Things is fired. 
The god of lost things is a barista, and he froths lattes with the best of them. But the names hastily written on the cups are not the names of the people who order them, but the names of the best friend they had in primary school who they haven't spoken to for years. Or the first girlfriend, the first boyfriend, the first person who was never their partner but who, nevertheless, scalpeled their name onto a heart. The god of lost things is, once again, fired. The god of lost things is an Uber driver, taking fares from across the city. He ferries people swiftly down roads long forgotten, but when he inputs the destination, his sat-nav doesn't show the route to where his fare wants to go, but rather to where they need to. The god of lost things is not fired, but he does receive a significantly below average rating. Sorry about the interview, he says as Bren sips her latte. It's fine, she says, tapping something out on her phone. I mean, we knew it was a long shot. Yeah, but I would have preferred not to nosedive in it quite so hard. I hope that didn't make you look bad. I've exceeded my targets for the past three quarters, Bren says briskly. My performance won't be in question. Oh, um, good, I think. Of course it's good. It's exemplary. I finally managed to unblock the application on Westmoreland, and we're finally going to have the developers moving in. No idea what Ashley was thinking when she was handling this. Oh. The God of Lost Things tries to sound interested. What's going to be done with it? Applications for a general mixed-use block. Bottom floor commercial, the rest posh flats. A few social housing shoeboxes they can point to come election time. The application says they'll keep the facade, though frankly with the state of that place they'll probably just bulldoze the whole thing and start from scratch. Oh. Well, good thing you're better at this than Ashley. Far better, apparently. I thought she was pretty competent, but looking at the mess. Honestly, I'm going to need to recommend her to Joan for a review. The god thinks about being sat across the table from that black hole of a woman, knowing your paycheck was on the line. He shudders. Maybe I'll learn to code, he says, changing the subject. Everyone needs code these days. Mmm. Or I could be a bus driver. I feel like that might be quite meditative, you know? Driving around the same route all day. Could be. Or maybe I could join the Space Corps, the god tries. And help the Jataxa Marines throw off the scourge of Velma the Interstellar Mango. You could try that. Bren, conversations work best when both people are paying attention. Yes, I know, she snaps. I've just got a lot on, she finishes the email. And honestly, she says, you should do what you do best. You find things. So find things, you've tried a lot of other things and been bad at all of them. Harsh? The god is affronted. Fair. Bren doesn't notice. I don't enjoy it anymore. And maybe somewhere there's a god of first world problems you can talk to about that. But I don't really know what else to say to you. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Any idea what you'd like to do instead? The god suggests. Though, no, I don't. Thanks for asking. He pauses. It's like I don't even know who I am anymore. Bren dismisses that with a wave and another glance at the screen. Look, I get it. You want to go find yourself, live your best life, be hashtag blessed. And like, sure, take a holiday, read a book, buy something stupid on eBay. But at some point, you've got to get back to work and start being productive. What happened to terrible ideas? Bren shrugs. Eventually, you need to start having good ones. There is a pause broken only by the screaming of Swifts overhead. Bren's phone dings again. She checks the email that just came in, mutters under her breath and begins typing. When the God of Lost Things came here, he thought he would tell Bren about the moment he stopped, the point he'd really given up on being the God of Lost Things. Not just the day he'd stopped going to work, how he'd spent a slow day with the book in hand and Garbage Island streaming on repeat, the shop as bare of customers as Joan was of heart. He was going to say how he had been looking through some of the items on his shelves and the things people don't care about finding, and how on one he'd found a wedding ring, a simple band of rose gold. He'd recognised it. A man had come into his shop two weeks ago and paid him for the location. It was his wife's, he said. He wanted to surprise her. The god had provided, and yet here the ring was. 
He had picked it up, let the object tell its story, saw it knocked from a bedside table, saw it bounce on a hardwood floor, saw it roll under the bed of the man his wife was sleeping with, and how he had thought before that despite being a very small god, he was benevolent. He set down no laws, asked for no sacrifice. He thought that in small ways, he helped people, and that wasn't true. Sometimes a thing became lost, because it was never meant to be found. He thought he would tell Bren this, but as she taps another email into her phone, he thinks she wouldn't really be interested. Afterward, he realises he doesn't remember what colour lipstick she was wearing, doesn't remember looking at her face at all. The Swifts have left. They're always the first ones to go, leaving behind an unnaturally silent sky. The Swifts see the future on their Vespa flights, and in the heat of summer their absence is the first reminder that the dark and the cold are returning. The baby Swift that lived in the God of Lost Things Eves fledged two days ago. The God saluted as it pulled itself out of the nest hole and launched itself shakily into the air and toasted its ascension with a fresh cup of tea. Now it wheels through somewhere the stars are a ceiling, and the clouds are a floor, and its feet may never again touch the ground. Bren has stopped talking to him. Or he has stopped talking to Bren. Or both. They didn't fight after that last cafe meeting. They didn't really do anything. It just felt like seeing each other was effort. For the god, everything feels like effort. Washing. Eating. Getting off the sofa. He hasn't done that for three days. The Swifts are gone. Bren is gone. He remains lost. The only thing he doesn't know how to find. There's a local news article about that building Bren mentioned, Westmoreland House. Large parts are now demolished, ready for something shiny and new. There's a photo with the back of Bren's head talking to some guy in a hard hat and suit. She does not look like the person with green pigtails and tequila anymore. Nor does she look like the ambitious one in the sharp suit who could still talk about gigs and romance novels and 18th century furniture and many other things which weren't city planning regulations. He liked that person. YouTube shows him an ad with a beach and a villa and two absurdly pretty people on top of a cliff. He thinks he could leave. The city holds nothing for him now. He could take a flight, go to the airport and buy a ticket on whatever plane was leaving next. He could follow the Swift, see if he could find himself on a Vespa flight of his own. He thinks, I'd like to do that, but doesn't move. The phone calls come when he is asleep, several of them in quick succession, arriving like bullets. The god does not notice. He finds them when he wakes. They're from Bren. There are multiple voicemails. He doesn't listen to them. Instead, he watches another couple of YouTube videos, checks the contents of the fridge, plays a flash game, which shouldn't work anymore on an ancient website. All the while, the phone does not leave him alone. It sits there with its messages, with its mocking missed calls. He listens. In the first one, Bren sounds fine, in the way that people do when someone has a gun to their head and is telling them to sound fine. Hi, I know we've not spoken in a while. I just wondered if maybe we could, um, maybe... The message trails off into silence. In the second one, she sounds smaller. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say this, but I don't know where else to go. It's... the thing is... When I look, I... This message also dies. In the third one, she says... It's my face. I've lost my face. The god puts down the phone and sits for a few minutes. He gets up, shaves, showers, finds some fresh clothes. Thinks I'm not a swift. Maybe my Vespa flight won't look quite the same. Maybe the reason I couldn't find myself was that I was looking for the wrong person. He picks up the phone, hits return call. Hey, he says, it's me. 
Murder in Prometheus is written by Neil Merton, performed by Kate Angier, and with music and production by me, Tris Oten. Check out my other show at lostterminal.com. It's got more science and less dread. If you like what we do, check out our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Prometheus. If you're not ready for that kind of commitment, please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this right now. Vesper Flights is a real book by Helen MacDonald. It's well worth reading and doesn't deserve to be lost. Join us on the next full moon, the 10th of September, for the finale of season one. See you there.